morning and welcome to chapel at ILT. I am Pastor Lou Hesse coming to you from Moses Lake, Washington, where I am pastor at Living Word Lutheran Church. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, the text for our consideration this morning is going to be the Old Testament reading for Lent 5. It's coming up in a week. This is taken from Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning at verse 31 through thir verse 34. <clears throat> it reads as follows. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the Old Testament reading. Dear friends in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. The text for our consideration this morning is taken from that Old Testament reading, just the very last portion, verse 34b. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Please join me in a word of prayer. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Your word is truth. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, my Lord and Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a little book by Thomas Cahill called The Gift of the Jews. It highlights one of God's gift to mankind, the gift of history. This is a contrast to all other ancient religions, this Jewish practice of history. The great religions of the East, this is typified actually today by the flag of India. They see creation and time as a big ever-turning wheel, and this wheel shows up on the flag of India. The wheel turns and cycles over and over back through time, according to their vision of world history. Buddhism does not even conceive the idea of creation. The universe has always been and always will be. One comes, one goes, one returns. No event is unique. No person is unique. Nothing is worth remembering. The goal, particularly in Buddhism, is simply to become nothing. But according to Cahill, the Jews invented history. He's a little wrong in this. The Jews didn't invent this. God gave it to them. God stepped into the world, into Jewish life, and spoke to Abraham, and history was born. We now have a beginning, life with meaning, and an ending. And the ending is not reincarnation. It's not a turn of the wheel, but a new beginning. Actions and people have meaning here and now, and, when remembered, on into the future. Not just one thing after another, the wheel of history slowly turning. God's story, a good creation, fell into sin, and God stepped into history and promised to rescue his creation. Memory is created. God tells his people, to remember. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is the Shema of Deuteronomy. God commands that the people remember this. Moses tells the people to recite it, to keep it on their lips, to teach their children. Every devout Jew learns to recite the mighty acts of God from memory, to remember like it happened yesterday, to bring it forward like it happened to me to use the memory of past events to learn from them, what to copy, 
what to discard, bad examples not to follow, good examples to follow. This is actually the basis of modern education, societal improvement, progress itself, the idea that we can remember, we can learn. This is God's gift of memory, God's gift to us. But as is true of all the best gifts of God, memory can be a curse in the hand of a fallen human. In my family, we have a reputation for having pretty good memories. And in my family, there are people who memory has become a curse for them. Memories can become obsessive and hurtful. One of my pastors grew up in a home that was distinctly dysfunctional. His mother and his grandmother were abused women, and they could never get over the hurts they suffered, and they abused a little boy out of vengeance and holding a grudge against the men that had abused them. And that little boy grew into a pastor who was eventually arrested and went to prison for crimes he committed. How many of us carry a memory of a bad experience and allow that memory, allow that grudge to continue to affect our lives for the rest of our time? I have a hunch it's more than just a few. Have you ever caught yourself saying, someday I will get even? Someday they will get theirs. Or as one of my neighbors one day told me as we were standing on the corner of a field talking about spring work and how it was going and how he had had problems with a third neighbor. Someday in this life or the next, that person will pay for what they have done. This is toxic poison in the mind of man. It's grudge holding and vengeance. It's memory. But memory is a good thing. Revenge, you know, is the stuff of best-selling books and television programs. Soap operas and storytelling of all kinds makes great stories. The Hatfields and the McCoys of West Virginia. That feud went on for generations. One of Shakespeare's best-loved plays, Romeo and Juliet, about two families with a feud that goes on and on. In history, we can see revenge being played out in the wars between England and France, Germany and Russia. Did you know that the Royal Guards of Greece wear a kilt with 400 plus pleats in it, one pleat for every year that the Turks ruled in Greece? They are never going to forget that the Turks held them under their thumb. Such is the glory of revenge and grudge. God, though, has something to say about this side of memory also. God does command memory. He says, Jesus says, on the night in which he was betrayed, do this in remembrance of me. God commanded the Jews to remember his mighty acts in history. But he also states, vengeance is mine. The split character of God on the issue of memory was brought home to me in introductory Hebrew with Dr. Hilmer at ILT. We were looking at the great commandments in Leviticus 19 in the original Hebrew. At verse 3 we have it, I am the Lord your God. You are to have no other gods, there are to be no idols. And then we come to verse 18 in that same chapter, Leviticus 19. And the end of that verse goes, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This, of course, is the second great commandment. But what was interesting was what precedes that little but in verse 18. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Preceding that in Hebrew are four little words. Lo tikom velo titor. Four little words. Two of them are the Hebrew command for never, lo. Much of the Ten Commandments in their Hebrew form come with that word in them, lo murder, lo steal, lo adultery, lo false witness. It's the strongest possible negation in Hebrew scripture. It's God's word for never. When people say never in the scripture, a different word is used. 
but God's strong word for never is lo. And so we have these two other words that go with the word lo in this passage. Two little words, tikom and titor. Lo tikom velo titor. Never hold a grudge. Never seek vengeance. In this passage of Leviticus, the very essence of love of neighbor as yourself is never holding a grudge and never seeking vengeance. It's explicitly stated. Now you hear the problem of God's good gift of memory. We misuse it. We sin with it. Forgive and forget is not just a slogan. We, of course, can never really forgive and forget. Our, memory try, our memories, try as we might, can never fully get us to a place where we are freed from our own memories. We need a Redeemer, someone to take those memories away, along with the sins that cause them. And God has provided. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We are to remember that. And that sin includes grudges and vengeance. Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. This is in Romans 12, verse 19. And he tells us what is done with vengeance in today's text. I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And best of all, Jesus demonstrated this precisely and perfectly when he returned from the grave. The disciples, you remember, were gathered behind locked doors in Jerusalem for fear of the Jews, it tells us in John chapter 20. And Jesus steps into the room. There's no grudge. There is no vengeance. He doesn't stand there with the accusation, how dare you leave me? How dare you abandon me to that cross? How dare you run away? Why are you hiding here in this room, scared spitless? Why aren't you out doing what I told you to do? No, Jesus steps into that room, raised from the dead, with no accusations, no condemnations for the disciples. He simply has one word for them, peace. So tonight I say to you, today actually, I'm going to preach this sermon again, Today I say to you, the peace of the Lord is with you. Jesus is with you. Your sins are forgiven. No more remembering the evils of the past. No more grudges. No more vengeance. They belong to Jesus now. And that, dear friends, is good news. Amen. Please join me in a word of prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.